Hello, good evening everyone. Welcome at the into the realms of nature and design and emerging technologies. So this evening uh, we have a special guest, Derek Lomas. Round of applause. <laughs> so um, we invited Derek to chat with us about AI and experience design, how like how does these two topics combine together? And we had also the, the pleasure of uh, meeting him last week because he organized a conference here in Amsterdam about AI and experience design. And um, we are really happy to have you here. And um, just to say something more, Derek is a tenor professor of positive AI. A round of applause. <laughs> which is uh, at the Faculty of uh, Design Engineering, Industrial Design Engineering at TU Delft. So before uh, leaving him the, the, um, the space, I just would like to share what happened this morning. Uh, so um, Sabrina, I and Derek had a meeting <laughs> and uh, we were helped uh, by this uh, AI meeting assistant <laughs> and uh, this were the sum up that we received from the talk and I swear that nobody talked about hosting a meetup for colleagues with children. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, when I saw this email coming uh, in, I was just uh, surprised and laughing a bit alone about how just in an unexpected way and an unconscious way we were uh, already having our first relationship with AI this morning. So I will give him the space to chat with us. Thank you. I swear I had the babysitter vote. Um, but it was last Thursday. And so now I'm joined by my two daughters, um, Mia and Mika. And so it's really cool that you guys are cool with uh, breeders and um, yeah, generative, generative AI. Okay. Anyway, um, we had this great conference last week and um, ChatGPT made the poster for us. It's really hard to get it to do the text right, but I, I, I like that it did this weird thing. Like, is that an advantage? Is that like creative? Is that, you know, it kind of <laughs> broke it up a little, like making the A white? I wouldn't have thought, <laughs> thought of doing that, you know? I liked it. Um, okay, so this is the big deal. You know, we have experience, machines don't. And that's special. And there's a really interesting intersection between our world of experience and the world of AI. AI needs our experience somehow, and it also shapes our experience, and that's what we're trying to figure out. So, I'm a human-centered designer, which is like a fancy term for <laughs> saying that I have ADHD. Um, <laughs> okay, so, uh, um, but yeah, I studied, uh, my postdoc advisor was this guy, Don Norman, if you know Don Norman, okay. and. Um, he didn't come up with this, but this is, this is a thing that I think is just really important. I think that of all disciplines, all disciplines care about experience, of course, but I think human-centered design of all scientific disciplines, it's really, it really has this human experience, how do we empathize, how do we understand other people's experiences, um, and how to shape them. And so this, this for me is my entree. Oh, this was, this was um, December 2021, so two years ago. I run this Christmas AI nativity uh, scene for our AI and design group. And at the time, this was NVIDIA's, it was the most advanced AI image generation program in the world. Um, 
And this is what you get when you type in Santa bot. Uh, which I think is really cool. I mean, it's totally Santa-y. Um, and then this was one year later. And so you, you guys were there, right? I mean, this all happened so fast. And we're in this, what do they call it? Punctuated equilibrium. You know, it's, things are gonna, they can't keep going at this speed. Okay, they, they can't. Um, my college professor was this guy, Nick Bostrom. Have you heard of Nick Bostrom? So he's famous for two theories. One is that we're living in a simulation. He wrote a really nice paper showing the math of why it's likely that we're living in a simulation, which I like from a morality perspective because it means that the biggest danger is that you're boring and then they turn it off. So, <laughs> okay. Um, and then the other thing that, uh, that he talks about is um, superintelligence and the danger that if we don't set the goals right of artificial intelligence, you know, if we come up with some AI and we say, make as many paper clips as possible, and then it turns the whole earth into paper clips. I mean, it's a silly story, but that's the sort of thing that now we have to take a little bit more seriously now. Um, it's just going so fast. So I think things are going to taper. We're going to go into a world of like really incredible AI. I don't, I think that five years from now, it's not going to be, ah, I have no idea what it's going to be like five <laughs> years ago. <laughs> Um, okay, here's, here's uh, something that I just thought was really cool. So I just wanted to share this. This was uh, Lucas Krobach. Um, he's like a real estate developer. He's not an architect, he's a real estate developer. And the idea that you know, you've got some space and you're like, oh gosh, what should we put there? And this is just a really weird way of doing design. Okay, it's a really weird way of doing design. Um, but it's, uh, I think it's really cool. Like it, it makes us imagine, you know, it make, it's like this layer of imagination that, that we have. Um, what happened? Uh, here's another, this is Hector Rodrigo, Hector Rodriguez. Um, and this is this tool, Crea.ai, you guys familiar with that? Show of hands, who knows Crea? Okay, um, it's nice, it's cool, it's real time and you can make pretty things with it very fast, and you get a lot of ideas very quickly. Um, it doesn't really know about manufacturing. It's not really something, I mean, and that's, that's, sort, of, that's sort of the big, big idea, and Tia, you said this, you know, uh, um, architecture is more than making a picture. <laughs> um, you know, there's, there's a lot of other things that, that need to happen, but it is important, and, and being able to extend our imaginations in this way, have some new playgrounds to explore, I think, it's a, I think it's a really positive thing, but it's a little scary just how crazy, I mean, those are some damn fine <laughs> shampoo bottles, you know? Like, really good. I liked all of them. So, it's magic. Lots of people say it's not magic. I say yes, it is magic. This is, this is crazy time. We are seeing these superhuman leaps in capability, and the big one is usability. Because a couple of years ago, if you wanted to use the most advanced AI algorithms, you had to be a computer scientist, you needed to have compute, you needed to collect data sets for a long time, and then it still turned out, you know, not, not that great. And um, this year, you know, ChatGPT, it is the world's most powerful AI system and my five-year-old can use it. He uses it to make, um, what was it? Yeah, like with the dinosaurs yeah. and, and, the, and the gingerbread house. Yeah. Ginger's like, I don't know, whatever, it's fun. <laughs> so, okay, this is a story about this antique that I was shopping for and then, um, and then I was like, what do I put on it? And then I used Dolly. And uh, then I said, because I just learned about Tia's work, um, and it was like all this really cool organic, you know, bio printed, I don't even know. And I was like, well, I don't know. Like, let's just put that in there for the vibes. And I got this. And I was like, wow, that's really cool. That would look good on my antique. You know, it's like, I don't know what to put there. So um, then my student Dino, he was like, well, he's got this system for being able to just take images and turn them into 3D 
objects, and then it's like boom, you know? It's like boom, that's magic. <laughs> okay, being able to just imagine something and then manifest it through some rituals, you know, that's magic, and that's design. And that's also intelligence. There's a really interesting connection between all of these things. Intelligence is defined essentially as being able to achieve goals, you know, in uncertain environments, that, that there's some way of uh, being able to make your goal happen, okay? And magic is about being able to make your goals happen. And design is about being able to make your, it's about manifesting, right? I, I mean, I don't know, I like that. So, I like the idea of magic because our clients keep asking for it. You know, they, they're going for the magic. I mean, you know, they do though. They really do. And we feel it and we know it and it's like, it's, it's, it's important. And it keeps us humble. We don't, if we think, oh, well the reason why this works is because of the, you know, neuroepinephrine um, things. I mean, it's, yes, you can come up with a story about psychology, about why things resonate with us, but it's, okay to just call it magic. Um, and I like this also because we need to be reasonable. We need to, we need to be logical. You know, this is what great designers do. They mix the intuition and the rationality. And um, they're opposites, but they're beautiful opposites coming together. Um, so what are we supposed to do when, right? Who's worried about losing their job because of AI? <laughs> Everyone looks around the room and is like, I don't know. <laughs> there is so much, is my daughter still in the room? There is so much fucking work to do, <laughs> okay? If AI can do my work, like I am so happy <laughs> because there is so much, there is so much work to be done. So much work to be done. And this is, I think, our job, right? Like, we gotta know whether it's feeling right. We can have goals, we can have metrics, we can have objectives, but does it resonate? Is something off? That's what we need to be um, doing. We need to be, like, whole-minded about it. And that's why I don't call it prompt engineering, I call it prompt vibing. And um, <laughs> I'm really serious about this. I'm really, really serious about this because engineering is, is a specific practice and it's important. And you know, you can do prompt engineering and what that looks like is when you, you build on the sort of science of prompting and you, you know, so, um, and, and ideally you've got some kind of outcome measure. So you've got a whole bunch of prompts, you're testing these prompts on some kind of outcome measure and based on that, you're optimizing, okay? That's, that's like an engineering approach. And that is not what we do. And, and what we need to do is we need to bring our intuition and we need to bring our empathy. It's weird empathizing with a robot, but you've all done it before if you've used ChatGPT. Because you build up this mental model of what the hell is it thinking? And like, what do I need to give it so that it can give me what I need? and you need to vibe with it. And I recommend alcohol because it helps <laughs> with the vibing. I'm serious, like sobriety is not the best state of mind for interacting with, with AI because it makes us too normal. And then you get this whole thing where it's just outputting this super boring stuff. You know what I'm talking about? You're using ChatGPT and you're like, ugh. <laughs> Light up a spliff and see what happens. Okay. Vibing with AI, yeah. So it's increasingly critical for designers to intuitively work with AI to achieve resonance because you're not gonna be able to just follow the rules to make it happen. And you gotta think about, well, what do I? Yeah, you get the, you get the idea. Um, uh, totally unrelatedly, I wrote a paper that took me quite a long time um, and published uh, just before all this happened about resonance as a design strategy for AI and social robots. And the basic idea is that resonance is a very big way um, of our own, I mean, it's, it's how we work cognitively. So um, my background's in neuroscience, so I can talk about things like this. And most importantly, I'm joined by some like, so Susanna Dicker, she's like a super top tier, Tim Mullen, they're like super top tier. Mm -hmm. Neuroscientists, um, Emily Cross, another top tier. And yeah, resonance is how things work, actually, in the brain. Like there are so, and I'll talk about this if I've got time at the end. Um, so the takeaway here is that an intuitive mindset 
is what we need to bring with it. And I, here I say not only, so not only an engineering mindset. <coughs> engineering mindsets are great, very useful. Don't drink. Um, but it is important to bring these other, you know, the other half of our brain. And this is what's so cool, is that it's a play-based function. We have to play with these tools to build up that intuition. There's no way around it. Unless you play with it, you don't know the, you know, its material properties. So play with it. Um, so this is, this is where I work when I go to campus. Um, I really like T-Delft. Anyone here from T-Delft? Yay! <laughs> Okay, I really like it, um, and that gender balance is what we go for um, in this faculty. The other faculty is not so much, but this faculty, good gender balance. Um, my background, so I did my PhD at Carnegie Mellon, and I focused on learning science and artificial intelligence. Um, I've got a company called PlayPower. I'm not really talking about that in this talk, but um, uh, we, we have a design practice that mostly serves education companies. So we help build, um, like, well, these days we're building like math tutor bots. Um, and, but most of, most of what we do is we help them with, with engineering and human-centered design in the context of education. We recently, brag alert, um, we recently got recognized by UNESCO for uh, this project that we did in the state of Rajasthan where we helped the government assess math and literacy for five million, five million students, um, grades uh, three through eight, uh, three times over the year. And what was cool about it is that uh, teachers could just take pictures of the students' tests. Um, and this was like this was not like a high stakes testing sort of thing, but they wanted to know can people read and write. And um, so we were able to get five million, fifteen million pages worth um, into our system, integrate with the government system, and everybody got the data the next afternoon. So even when you do these bubble sheet kind of things, you don't get the data for months. And but when you can get the data back to the teacher and the parents can come in the next week, then you have this feedback loop where you can really promote learning at the same time that you're providing this accountability at a government level. So this, this is a story just about, um, that's not generative AI, though there is some generative AI components to it, but there, there's a lot of really interesting social impact opportunities that can happen um, with, with these te technologies. So this is us, Play Power, that's smart paper. Um, we also have a company called NeuroUX that makes cognitive assessments. Um, we design, so we design a lot of games. I don't even mention that, but we design a lot of games. Um, this was one of the games that, uh, it's called Battleship Number Line. It's about fractions. It's really cool. Um, we still have a few thousand kids every week that, uh, that play this game, and we run a lot of experiments. And this is what I did my PhD on, is where you can run these A-B tests to see how different, so you, you, you know, there's a robot spotted at one tenth, and you've got to click on where you think it's hiding, and then you develop these intuitions for estimating fractions on a number line. Well, what we did is we were like, well, let's take this online game and use all these thousands of players, and then we use machine learning to automatically optimize the design, and it totally worked. We were able to increase the engagement, so how long people were playing the game, um, by like 25%. And then we got calls from the company that we were hosting. They were like, you got a bug in the game, check it out. And that ship had grown to be the size of the screen because kids really enjoyed clicking it. It was making these huge explosions. <laughs> and we're like, oh shit. You know, <laughs> there was no human in the loop. You know, so that was a real lesson for us because we realized that this mindless optimization can get misaligned and turn us all into paperclips. So, um, but there is something really important, which is that if you can measure it, you can optimize it. And I think that that's a really important heuristic. So even though this is dangerous, it's super powerful. And we know this. Um, and there's this really interesting tension between feeling and measurement, right? They're like different worlds, the world of math and the world of experience. But they overlap. So a lot of my work focuses on measuring experience because it's important and valuable. Um, it's so what I do with this AI and experience research group. Um, one of my students made this project land shapes. I'm sorry the res isn't as high as it is, but 
this was done with uh, um, Google AI as well, and this was sort of uh, you know, back in the days of um, generative adversarial networks. Anyone knows those? So uh, we collected all this big data set of satellite imagery, and then we optimized. Um, uh, yeah, we all all this is fake. You can bring her any time, yeah. Um, and so what we wanted to know is that if we could measure the beauty of the images, we could optimize the outcomes. Um, measuring beauty is a big part of what my senior professor focuses on, Paul Heckert. He studies the sort of science of aesthetics and um, really cool. So what uh, we found is that, yeah, if we retrain the GAN with beautiful images, it would tune the AI to produce more beautiful landscapes. Sorry, this is a terrible graph, but it did work. Um, but the problem was is that it turned everything into coastlines because people like coastlines more than they like deserts. And that's the bias kind of coming out. Now, aesthetic bias is interesting. Like, yeah, we definitely have a bias for things being pretty. Is that bad? Well, if you lose this sort of diversity, that it can be. Um, so, uh, right, if you can measure it, you can create an AI model to optimize it. This is important. I think AI can understand. I think it's really important that we treat AI as, and there's some good theory about wh what that means. If we need to call it machine understanding, let's call that, but it deals with concepts. And it understands emotions. It doesn't feel, but it does understand emotions and it's getting better and better. And to show this, we did this study, so we're looking, a person expressing amusement I mean, it didn't really get it, right? Uh, yeah, right? God, yeah, really. So what we did is we had people rate the alignment. This is like our alignment research. Uh, so we're looking at the alignment of the image to the text, expressing the emotion resentment. Where would you put that? Four. Yeah, exactly. People have different opinions, so you gotta, you gotta do some statistical analysis. That's, and so we, we run, we had a bunch of people gather a lot of data, do statistical analysis, and um, then, you know, Dolly 3 came out. Um, gratitude, right? Oh, so we did this with both people and robots. And what we found was that Dolly 3 understood emotions much better than Dolly 2 and much better than stable diffusion V1. Um, so it's getting better and better. It was able to do emotions better with people than robots in general. Um, and then there's this emotional granularity piece where it was better at some emotions than others. So resentment, it had a harder time doing resentment than shock. Um, anyway. So uh, then this was, this was another project. We're like, well, okay, we know it can do pictures and text. Can it just like do a product? Or can it print it? Um, and so this is Dino. And Dino was in the Financial Times last week because uh, um, it's a cool story. It's a cool story about how you're able to turn things into a physical outcome. Um, so for instance, he said, a symmetric opal glass <laughs> lamp with very smooth curvatures suitable for 3D printing. And you get this. It's like, nice. And then uh, you can make this 3D digital model. There are various tools for turning images into to 3D, like um, Kadeem um, and Wonder 3D, and there's a bunch of other ones now. And now it's this. I think that actually turned out better. It's 3D printed. And it's 3D printed with the thing where they've got lasers shooting into the goo. You know that, you know that one? Yeah. It's so cool. It's so cool. It's like totally futuristic where you just have lasers shooting into this goo and this lifts out. I'm not making that up. Um, anyway, so these are just examples of that. So here, here, is, here is the first one that he did. And, uh, and I was like, well, how long did it take? So it was like two hours of like vibing with Mid Journey, and he gets something, and he's like, "Yeah, okay, I can make that." And then two hours to generate the 3D model with the the Kadeem AI. And then two hours to optimize, because you know there's still some issues. So you got to get in there and fix some things. And then, you know, that's not the prettiest one, but it was the first one. And it took 12 hours, and he got that down about half. 
During his project, he realized, I mean, he wasn't much of a coder at the beginning, but he realized that he could code, and he was really good at coding with ChatGPT. And this is, this is just something, because we often distinguish ourselves as like, oh, well, I code, I don't code, et cetera, et cetera. And who here can program quantum computers? Raise your hand, everybody, because it turns out you can. That's some work that a student of mine is doing. Um, it's crazy. You can't really use quantum computers for much of anything these days, but if you wanted to, you could with ChatGPT. Um, so he made, he made all these UIs for generating lamps, um, and he made UIs for helping people think about what lamps they wanted to design. And from this, he created this really large database of lamps that he got all these people to make. And then we just had too many lamps. So there were like so many lamps. And um, so what he did is he made this UI to let people say whether they like or dislike each of these lamps. He sent it around. And he ended up getting 6,000 ratings, um, each image rated 3 to 15 times. And then the question was, can models of human desire, because what, I, I think this is right, rate your interest in owning a 3D printed version of this lamp. So it's like, do you want this? It's not whether you think it's pretty. Do you want this in your house? OK. Um, so can models of human desire be used by AI design uh, more desirable? Can't read that. Can models of human desire be used by AI design? <laughs> Shit. To design. Sorry. Uh, right, to design more desirable physical products. So um, for this, we use this LoRa, this low rank adaptation algorithm. So, um, and I've got another student now that's working on combining this with mood boarding, because you guys probably do that. So um, what you need are images and text descriptions. And so we took the same 50 prompts, we put it through the LoRa model and plain vanilla stable diffusion. And then we got these 50 images out from both, so 100 images. Th this is just an example of what LoRa can do. Um, like if you train it on a set of line art images, and you don't need that many. That's what's cool about it. You, you know, 20, 30 line art images, and it'll get the idea. Um, and he found that it increased the visual appeal by 50%. Um, and you can probably guess which side is Laura? <laughs> mm. Well, what's interesting is that not only did it make it prettier, it also made them more lampy. OK, um, so if you can measure desirability, you can create an AI model to optimize it. That's fucking terrifying. Oh, my daughter's here. Sorry. OK, so the idea that we're going to have these AI models. OK, yeah, sorry, sorry for that. So the idea that we're going to have these AI models that can just optimize things based on our desire, I mean, that's, this is a weird future that we're going into. And we're going to love it. We're going to love it. Uh, but what else might we optimize? So what I care about is optimizing well-being. Because as far as I can tell, that's really you know, that's what it comes down to. Like We want to have positive experiences, flourishing, whatever, whatever you call it, happiness. Like that's, that's obviously the core. But I like, um, I like well-being. And if I, I get a minute, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the concept of harmony and how that relates well-being to things outside of human experience as well. But um, so positive AI, my PhD student just finished on this. And that's uh, applying principles of positive psychology and positive design to artificial intelligence. And AI for well-being is essentially making sure that AI systems are sensitive to the factors of well-being and positioned so that they can support well-being. So um, what time is it? Eight. Eight. Am I over? I can end. Do you guys want to talk? No. Yeah? <laughs> Give me like a time limit then. What do you want? We're all so flexible. Uh, I really, I really, I, I really appreciate it. Okay, so um, I like to think about AI not as a servant, not as a slave, not as a, you know, not as even as another person. It's my exocortex. Okay, it's just this other layer of me. Okay, when I use it, it's just, it's like the voice in my head. You guys have that voice in your head, right? 
Yeah, I'm not alone, right? <laughs> okay, so it's really nice having this voice outside my head that I can share. Like, that's cool. And, and, and I think that this is, we'll have some growing pains in sort of figuring this out, but we're gonna have our human core and we're gonna grow this big exocortex. That's the positive view, anyway. Um, also, AGI is already here. Do you guys agree with that? Okay, well, um, someone who's like Peter Norvig, who wrote the textbook, the most popular textbook on artificial intelligence, last month published Artificial General Intelligence is already here. So, Buyakasha, this is, um, he makes a really good argument, I think, which is that we're in a continuum. And there's, a, there's a, uh, an analogy to be made between earlier specialized computing systems, like in the early 1900s, like these more analog computing systems. You could do differential equations, but you couldn't program anything. It, and then you develop general purpose computing. And it was really simple at first, but then the general purposeness of it grows. And he says, look, we've got general purpose artificial intelligence, and we should recognize that and contrast it to the narrow AI that has been you know, dominant previously. We define AI as the study of agents that receive percepts from the environment and perform actions. That's fucking broad. I mean, that's like really broad, um, but I think that's appropriate. AI is also more than 100 years old, based on that definition. So for instance, autopilot was invented in 1914. Okay, so before computers. So if autopilot, like that's sort of AI, right? Plain autopilot. Um, so I like to think about cybernetics. I really like cybernetics, and I think of it in this continuum. And uh, the nice thing about cybernetics is that it doesn't have to be artificial. Sometimes when you're designing artificial intelligence, it's like if people are still involved, you're not done. Like you're not done until there are no people in the picture. And that's unhealthy. And cybernetics has a, has a view that allows you to think about the design of systems that can include natural systems. And I think that's, that's more healthy. Um, cybernetics, you know, there are lots of existing cybernetic systems just in nature. And um, the core idea is that it's just this sen sensing and action feedback loop where there's some kind of goal that's embodied somehow. Cornelius Drebbel is my fav uh, favorite Dutch cybernetic alchemist. Looking for <laughs> other others, but... Um, so awesome, and he uh, he invented. So there's a ton of things that he did. And I'm like, he's like just a super, super, super cool dude. But um, he invented the first thermostat, so self-governing oven, so that he could incubate eggs, um, and had a big impact on uh, the development of the Royal Society, and was so popular it uh, got translated into Chinese, like within a couple of decades of his invention. So that was pretty cool. Anyway, we not only need to think about designing, because it's not just about AI. Like that's almost like a bait and switch sort of thing. Like we need to think about governance. We need to think about organizations, corporations. Like it's much bigger than the algorithms. And when you take a viewpoint towards system design that involves artificial intelligence, if you're not thinking about all the other things, it's going to be really narrow. Like if you think about AI in the context of Netflix and you're not thinking about autoplay, like that's a really important part of it, even though it's not like the algorithm, right? I mean, it's, you get what I'm saying. So um, we've, uh, we've been using these well-being feedback assessment loops um, at, uh, at a large scale to try to see how to help humanize governance uh, at the university. Um, so basically it involves assessing the factors of well-being and motivating action by the community. Okay, another provocation, uh, AI is underhyped and that's because actually it's useful and you can use it every day. And at least in the Gartner hype cycle, that plateau of productivity is when things are not so hypey. So, you know, I'm not gonna say there's no hype out there, but I think in a lot of ways it's, it's underhyped. And part of the reason for that is that it's actually a lot more powerful once you have skills. And a lot of times people don't have those skills and so they think it's sort of lame, but once they develop the skills, they, they really can be a lot more productive with it. Um, probably know this study, 
they did a controlled experiment uh, with this Boston Consulting Group, and they found that they did more faster and had higher quality. Um, that's neat. It makes me more ambitious. I'm like, how can I create like a cloud seeding system to solve global warming? You know, and like do that in an afternoon, right? I'm working on it. It's awesome. Um, but I don't necessarily do things faster, honestly. It because I end up having to just do it again. But it's okay. But but things do, I think, turn out better. Um, ChatGPT can't finish the job. The last 10% is always half the work. I think that's important to know. No one to quit. That's usually where I quit. I should quit. But I want to tell you about <laughs> residents and vibes. Okay, give me like two more minutes and I'm just going to zoom through this so that you know what it's about. Because resonance is such a cool topic and it's esoteric. It's in this sort of magic space, but it's scientific. It's like super scientific. Do you guys know this one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They all line up. It's incredible. It's totally incredible. There are so many functions in our brain that enable that to happen. Like th that kind of entrainment, that's how we work. That's how language works. That's how music works. And, right. Um, and it's magical. And in fact, that was the definition of magic back in the day. They said, how does magic work? By sympathy. There's a natural concord of things that are alike. So that's cool. And we've got, you know, it's the magic of global telecommunications. Electromagnetic resonance. Neurons are oscillators. That's what's important to know. So if you've got a brain that's filled with billions of oscillators, there's going to be tons of resonance effects. Um, because re resonance manifests in any system where you have oscillation. Um, so you have this all over the place. Heartbeats, breath, sleep, music, dance, talking, sex. It's like there's a lot of rhythm in human life. So um, right, we look at this stuff, psychological alignments that synchronize and amplify. Synchronization and amplification. These are the two hallmarks of resonance. They get things synced up and they amplify. So um, right, Vibe Research Lab, that's what we do, resonance and hyperscanning. Resonance is when an alignment of elements synchronizes and amplifies. And harmony, which I'm like, it's my like obsession, I'm totally into it. Um, is the integration of diverse elements uh, into a whole. So it's about the creation of wholeness. And wholeness is sort of the key thing. Um, and if I'm going to, sorry, um, it's right in the beginning of the SDGs for the UN that it's about creating harmony with nature. It's a good goal. What does it mean? Um, I think that we need to be more careful about our understanding. It's not just a, a synonym for good. It has specific meanings. If you look it up on Google, it says harmony can be described as sameness, which is super lame. Like that's just really not what it's about. And so Confucius says uh, the good person harmonizes but does not seek sameness, whereas the petty person seeks sameness but does not harmonize. But Google didn't read that. So um, that's what I'm telling you. So integration of diverse elements into a whole. And it's, you know, conflict is part of harmony. It's like part of the thing. And, and being able to figure out how to take these conflicting elements and get the power from the conflict that can generate this flow. Anyway, um, la, la, la. You can read this paper. It's 60 pages long. You're not going to read this paper. But I designed the paper so that it's really easy to skim. So someday, maybe, <laughs> like it's so easy to skim. It was like just totally a skim thing. So final thing here is, and this is why I think it's important, because well-being is, is really at the core of, of experience. But there are things that are so connected to our individual experiences. Like we obviously need to take care of this planet. And it, it's hard to say that you have to do it just for its own sake. But everything's connected. And so harmony is this mechanism to be able to connect the individual to the natural world. Um, is I think uh, that's how that's like a classical philosophical perspective. Anyway, I'm not going further. I really appreciate your patience and letting me uh, come out here and talk with you guys.